Welcome, investigator. Evil is on the rise. Crime is escalating. Our mission is to eliminate the crime by exposing evil, examine why it manifests, and highlight the brave souls that confront it every day. Join us as we work together to bring justice to every victim. Welcome to All Things Crime. Here's your host, Jared Bradley. Hey, everybody. It's Jared, your host with All Things Crime. Welcome to another episode. I'm excited this morning to have a number of guests on here from Mobile Sheriff's Department and Intermountain Forensics Crime Lab. And we are going to be talking about a pretty unique case where it was a Jane Doe for a lot of years, and which isn't in itself exclusionary, but how this case was solved, I think, was pretty amazing. And so definitely wanted to bring uh, Olivia JT and Danny on with us to to talk about this case. And so, guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. You bet. So we're going to start with Olivia. Olivia, why don't you introduce yourself really quick so the, the audience knows who, who we're talking to. Okay. My name is Olivia McCarter. I'm a genealogy analyst for the Mobile County Sheriff's Office and a co-owner of Moxie Forensic Investigations. I was the lead genealogist for this Jane Doe case. Awesome. JT? Hello, I'm Sergeant JT Thornton with the Mobile County Sheriff's Office. I worked at the uh, municipal police for three years and then came over to the Sheriff's Office. I've been here for about 13 years now. So how many years total is that, JT? 16 total. Right on. Okay. Appreciate it. Danny? I'm Danny Helwig. I'm the Director of Laboratory Development for Intermount Forensics. We're a nonprofit forensic lab out in Salt Lake City, Utah. And my job is basically case consultation. I'm the guy who talks to the investigators and works through some of the details on how to how to process these cold cases. Awesome. And Danny's been on before. So if you go way back in the archives, what was that? A couple of years ago when we were in the middle of COVID, I think I, I begged you to come on the show, right, Danny? Always. I'm there for you, man. Always. <laughs> Always a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Especially was, during uh, COVID. I mean, come on. Yeah. Back when, um, you know, Zoom was our only form of communication. And uh, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a rough time. So, well, guys, welcome. And you know what? This case, as, as people, it's interesting for me, you know, being with MVAC systems, we typically don't know what cases are being worked on. And so when, when big news breaks, it, it, especially when it hits like Forensics Magazine and things like that, it's, it, it seems like I'll, my phone just starts blowing up and I'll start getting emails and text messages from all, all my friends around the country that, are, that see these, this news and you know, it's just fantastic because we, we love it. And we especially love giving the accolades to the people that are on the front line solving it, which is you guys. So that's another reason why I wanted to have you on. You know, I, I know as investigators, you guys don't, don't enjoy tooting your own horn, but I do. So I, I, I want to give you guys, uh, you know, the, the thumbs up and the accolades that you deserve for, for solving these kind of cases because Frankly, it's, it's, it doesn't happen enough. And, you know, just serving and doing what you guys do, uh, you, des- you deserve, you know, every accolade we can possibly give you. So, JT, I want, I want you to kind of, if you could, explain who the, the victim was and, and who, um, uh, you know, how, how you ended up with this case. I grew up in a little town called Gray Bay. It's in... Uh... Alabama and Mobile County. Uh, grew up hearing about this case ever since I was a kid. People in a small town they always talk, and things tend to stick out in their minds. So when I had the opportunity, while I was assigned to, I do believe it was uh, youth investigations. I got a little bit bored because we'd have a giant case load and went looking for something to do, and found this case and began working on it and trying to track down leads and work through everything that was in her case file, which was quite a bit, despite it not really going anywhere and kind of petering out. Yeah, well, uh, who who is Ada? Ada was a... Uh, <laughs> 
She was a woman from the uh, West Coast of the United States, which really led to a bunch of uh, dead ends here because, like I said, close community. Usually somebody knows each other, but nobody had any idea who she was. It wasn't until we decided to send the uh, dental mold off for testing that we would eventually get a lead that definitively said that the J. Doe found in Sessions Creek in Grand Bay, Alabama in 76 was Ada Fritz. Yeah, and so Ada, from what I've read, and Olivia, you can help out with this um, because I I, I got some of it off of your your website, the Moxie. Is it Moxie.com? It's MoxieForensics.com, yeah. Uh, MoxieForensics.com. So I found some cool information on there, so everybody needs to go uh, check out their website. And But Ada was born in Wyoming, and do you guys have any idea how – some lady that was born in uh, Wyoming in 1914 would end up in uh, Arkansas and Alabama? Apparently, once she retired from the Oregon State Hospital, where she worked at for many years in the laundry department, she traveled the world and went on really long fishing trips. So that's kind of why I think she was down here. Her mom had just passed away, so I think that she went on a trip. Okay. And, but basically if she was just traveling kind of by herself, I mean, that would make a lot of sense why if she, um, you know, disappeared, then nobody would really report her as missing. So last known residing in Arkansas, I'm just kind of reading this. The remains were found May 18th in 1976 and uh, gunshot to the back of the head and their hands were mutilated. Uh, JT, any insight on to who would have shot her and, and mutilated her hands or why? The mutilation of the hands is a good indicator that they were trying to obstruct law enforcement from identifying the deceased. Also, there were bags wrapped around her wrist where her hands would have been and also her head. This was most likely to keep blood from entering into the trunk of a motor vehicle. There are also some other indications on the scene that this person was likely acting alone and moving the body by themselves, which we do have some people that were in the area at the time. They really couldn't identify the vehicle, but they said it was just one person outside of the car in the multiple accounts we have of that evening. Was that, I, I, I'm assuming that now that you've identified the victim, this has turned into a homicide investigation. Yes, the suspect, though, is a Henderson James Williams. He murdered his mother in the 90s and also disposed of her body in the same manner. And she was probably, I'd say, less than 10 miles from where Ada Fritz's body was found in 76. And also, Mr. Williams was arrested in uh, Newport News, Virginia, and I want to say 1973 for another murder, but they have no records indicating why he was released after only 28 days in jail. Wow. So he was arrested for murder and then released 28 days later? Yes, that was in 73, and then we have Miss Fritz who shows up deceased down here, and then in 94, Mr. Williams turns around and murders his own mother which that murder actually occurred in Mississippi where he was arrested and convicted and sentenced to uh, life in prison in Parchman, which is in Flower County, Mississippi. He passed away in uh, 2008. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it seems like a really good guy. <laughs> well, so you... Um, now, my understanding is even once... Um, well, when... In 76, they have this, this victim. She's been shot in the back of the head. Her hands are mutilated. But if you can't identify her, then you also can't keep her. So she was eventually cremated, from what I understand, and, and buried from... I, I, there was like a, a charity or something that uh, paid for that, correct? From my understanding, yes. And then the uh, cremains or cremated remains were placed into a... Uh large grave with some other cremated remains. Okay. So we had absolutely nothing to test for uh, DNA to identify her at that time. 
And that's where you came in, right, Olivia? Yes. Um, we discovered that Miss Fritz was cremated by the Anatomical Donations Program at the University of South Alabama back in 1979. Um, so my job just kind of went right out the window. There's no body. There's no DNA. So how how do you uh, figure out the dental mold? Uh, JT had found an old dental mold that had been shoved in her mouth, even though she had no teeth. So we have no idea why that they took the dental mold in the first place, but we found that in storage. And I did not know what to do with it whatsoever. Um, I believed that it had previously failed swabbing tests, but... Um, we could never get anything from it. I figured any testing that we would do would be a long shot, and I thought it would fail. Well, you have little faith. I did. Okay. Right now. This, this dental mold was in storage for 50 years. It was covered in rat droppings, and it, you know, they didn't wear gloves back then. In, in 1976 when they would have taken it. So I figured it would have been contaminated by whatever CSI or autopsy tech put this in her mouth. I figured it would be full of male DNA and we wouldn't have gotten anything. Well, but you figured out that may as well take a shot at it, right? I figured we might as well take a shot. It was our last shot because you can only invex something once from my understanding. And I, I asked Danny, I said, would you swab this? What would, what can I do with this to get any sort of DNA? And he kind of got back to me within a few days and he was like, you should invex this. Like, we should invex this. And I said, okay, let's try it. It's our last shot. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And that's it. So... I put a lot of pressure on him, I guess, but he he got it. Well, personally, that's I mean, music to my ears, right, Danny? And I yeah, mean, I mean, it's back this goes thing to, goes to show you the right tool for the job. So you sent the dental mold to Danny, and Danny, what uh, what happened from there? Well, Olivia and I talk through cases often, and so it, it, it's my job to look through evidence see and most times it's it's pretty iffy on what we can find what we can work with and she brought up this case we started talking through it and you know the first comment was yeah we don't have a body what is that about how how is how is that even possible so i was feeling pretty uncomfortable with the fact that we were going to get anywhere with this it, it's i mean how do you identify a a deceased individual without the actual body to identify. But yeah, we, it, it made sense. Oral area is very rich in DNA. The conditions of storage weren't the greatest, but um, we leave no stone unturned, right? So you go out and find the best, best bet, use the best tool available and see what you can do. It made sense to use MBAC, ne not necessarily the most conducive to swabbing and God, we got to max out what, what biological material we can get off of, off of this. So we talked through it, and I'll be honest, I was a bit, I, I don't get your hopes up, but we'll see what we can do. And we, we got it in-house. We did work the, the end back, got a got decent return on material off, off of the, the object itself, and sort of, Crossed our fingers, did DNA extraction, quantification, and and just sort of prayed that things turned out okay. And I'll be honest again, when we got the results back and saw there was a decent amount of DNA there, a, a pretty solid amount of DNA, honestly, I was I was pretty impressed. I was pretty impressed and and a bit shocked. I think that that conversation that we had Olivia there was was a pretty unique one. And here you go, we can do this. This is gonna work. Yeah, he called me when he got the results, and Danny never calls me, so I thought something was up. And I was like, oh my God, what happened? And he said, this dental mold got 145 nanograms, and it's not badly degraded. And I swear, like, I was in a state of shock. I was in a meeting, and I still answered, because he never calls me. And I think I called JT right away, and I was like, you'll never guess what just happened. So before we get into your reaction too, too far, Danny, explain how you would use the MVAC 
on a dental mold because, <laughs> frankly, I've seen a lot of stuff sampled. And I've never seen a dental mold. How did you do it? Well, you know, initially the idea was we just need to maximize the amount of DNA off of this. And I mean, the, the, that, that screams I'm back. You use the right tool in the toolbox. And, and in this case, I mean, swabbing didn't look conducive. There's rough surfaces. It just didn't it physically work that great. So we, we brought it back. And I, I would say it was a interesting technique to try and make it work. But I really just had to get get some material down and, and hit those cracks and crevices and, and pull it back up. You can kind of get a little bit of an indication how, how well it works when you're when you see the filter that it goes on. And it, I, shockingly, I mean, it look, looked pretty solid. The, the shock that we got when we saw how much DNA came out of it, that was that was a bit bit bigger than expected. But physically, it took a little doing, but it seemed to work. So the sampling had... Did it actually fit down into the mold very well or just kind of have to hose it down and then vacuum it up later? We tracked over the surface as much as we could. So, yeah, I mean, it, it fit in work in the places that, that where you can and just pull out material where you can. It it worked. I mean, it just, it, 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 I wouldn't say it was the perfect object and shape, but you make it work. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd put it right in that category of rocks and bricks and, you know, other exactly. crazy porous exactly. items that, that I've seen get, get profiles from. But, you know, it's not going to, for those of you that are that are listening, that, imagine the sampling head of the MVAC is about an inch, a little less than an inch and a half wide. And so you, you can imagine that it's not going to fit down into a dental mold very well. You know, I... I I don't even, they don't even use those things anymore, do they? Maybe like a mouth guard for a football or something. Anyway, it's not, it's not going to fit in there very well. But, you know, you put, you put a tool like that in the hands of people that really know what they're doing, like Danny here, and, um, yeah, they can work miracles. So, so let's go back to uh, the phone call. And I, and I agree, Danny doesn't call unless there's something major going on. You know, he's, he's not very uh, communicative that, <laughs> that way, but. You no, know, I get text messages from him on occasion, and it's just like, dude, you wouldn't believe what happened. So I love getting his text, that's for sure. So, Olivia, you got that text. You were in a meeting or, or a call. Yeah, I was. The call's even more dramatic. I was in a meeting with the sheriff, actually, and I still answered. And he, he was like, I got 145 nanograms from your dental mold, and it's not that bad. And I think... It was shocking because I was so sure this was not going to work. But then I got really excited, obviously, because this was going to be our chance to identify this lady. This is it. So what did the sheriff say? Oh, God. He was just like, all right, go ahead and do your thing. He wasn't too excited. I'm not even going to lie. He didn't even know what case I was talking about. Okay. We have a lot of cold cases. Yeah, well, I, I imagine Danny can help out with those, right, Danny? Always, always. So, JT, what um, you get this call from Olivia and about this breakthrough? What, what, uh, what was your reaction? I was excited because this was uh, one that I worked on for a while, and there have been a, a lot of others that had worked on it. And I mean, the stars finally aligned, and the planets aligned, and Science actually came through and uh, saved the day on this one, thankfully. So that resolves all of our uh, cases from 1976. This was uh, one of two Jane Doe's we had for that year. So that, that wrapped them all up for 1976. Well, congratulations. That's fantastic. I just, I, again, having, um, uh, getting the background of, of this kind of a, just, I, I, I can't imagine on any, not just in necessarily on this particular case, but on any kind of, a, especially a Jane Doe where, you know, you may have a relative that just disappeared and, and you have no idea where he or she is. And, and then 30, 40 years later, the family finds out that, oh yeah, she, you know, in this case, Ada was uh, in Arkansas and ended up deceased in Mobile, Alabama. And yeah, they finally solved this case. So couple of things that, that from every cold case that gets solved, I, it's just amazing to me 
the persistence and just the, the doggedness that investigators have toward all of these cold cases and solving it. It doesn't matter how old the case is. You guys are just always, always trying to figure out a new angle on how to, how to get to evidence and, and the next lead that could lead to a breakthrough and eventually solve a case. And it's just, you know, folks like you guys that are out there, you know, fighting the good fight for, um, for everybody to receive justice, honestly, is, is just, it's inspiring to me. So, well, and what's, uh, what's next for this case, JT? Uh, we're pretty much, I mean, we're dead there. We have identified the victim and the offender is deceased. I mean, that, that's pretty much it on our end. So we'll move on to the next cold case. And after that one, we'll keep going until we get as many of these done or I'll retire, which I'll probably retire before we get all of them done. Well, yeah, and there, I imagine there'll be a few, a uh, few new ones before you retire, but well, luckily, technology has come so far that we have not had any within the past decade or so. So we're actually making advancements with that because, I mean, it's a lot easier for us to catch bad guys these days and a lot harder for them to hide than it was back in the day. Oh, for sure. I, I, don't, I don't know how anybody can, can uh, get away with a case nowadays. Mm-mm. It's like, you know, you're sloughing DNA everywhere, and even if you were to, to hide your fingerprints – from somebody, you know, eventually you just can't hide all the DNA. Would you agree with that, Danny? Yeah. And the cool part is the technologies just keep getting more investigative and paradigm shifting. I mean, you've got MVAC, you've got gene- forensic investigative genetic genealogy, which is just a game changing technology in both the unidentified human remains as well as, as cold case homicide type uh, situations. It's, everything just feels like a really cool time to be in the field. Uh, it's just, you're seeing just monumental changes in, in how we do business. And from a lab perspective, it's fun because we can actually have these conversations where we can say, all right, here's, an, here's a forensic investigative genealogy profile that we obtained from some sample that shouldn't have worked that did and then drop that off into Olivia's lap and and then, and then we get to be play the waiting game to say, uh, hey, did, you, did you find her yet? Did you find her yet? Did you find her yet? <laughs> but it's just, it's just really rewarding from a lab perspective because you just have more tools to use to, to get results where 10, 15, 20 years ago, it just didn't exist. Yeah. Well, I, I can't tell you how crazy busy I am. I mean, literally, I'm almost on the road every week from now till Christmas. And a lot of it is just because there's so many agencies and labs that are getting MVACs. And because of stories like this, a lot of, a lot of people hear these success stories and they're like, you know what, we need better access to GEDmatch and genealogical DNA, but they also need to be able to collect it off the evidence when they have it. So there's a huge need for it. And I'm not complaining, you know, I mean, it's, uh, (laughs) Being away from the family, you know, three or four days out of the week, there's worse things that I could be doing. So, well, guys, any last words on on this case? It's um, it's a huge victory for Mobile Sheriff's Office. Uh, my, my last words are just for all the lawmen and women out there. If you got these cases, yes, you're difficult. Yes, it's worth solving. Just keep plugging away. And if you don't have anything right now, don't lose hope because... One day somebody like Danny might come along and Olivia and be there to help you solve it. Absolutely. Olivia, what do you think? You're, you're part of um, a genealogical research and, you know, focusing on, you know, DNA genealogy trees. It's solving a lot of really cool cases. Yeah, I guess I would kind of piggyback off of what JT said and just say don't give up because, I mean, this family has been waiting for 47 years and they finally know what happened to their aunt. And it's just, it's a big feeling of closure for them. Makes it all worth it for all of the years of investigations that has gone through this case. Makes it all worth it. Oh, absolutely. Out of all the things I've ever done, just being a small part of helping solve some of these cases for me is just, it's so rewarding. It's just amazing. So, well, guys, I appreciate you coming on and it's been uh, fantastic. It just, 
you know, what a cool story. Solving a 47 year old cold case is just what it, what a feather in your cap. So congratulations on that and appreciate you coming on and telling us about it. Thanks for having, Thanks for having us. You My bet. Pleasure. Good talking to you. See you guys down the road. Thanks for joining us. Your attention today brings us one step closer to exposing and eliminating the evil that brings crime to our communities. Hit subscribe and share this episode. Together, we will bring justice to every victim.